So when I think about events and hosting, and I've helped hundreds of people now host their first event, the biggest piece of advice I say for somebody like you who wants to use this for business is don't start focus on your top shelf, on your business, on your premium leads. You know, we've talked about doing this for like networking events, which I know get a bad rap, but like, how do you see some creators doing this today? Are, are they kind of leveraging this? So the average listener who's a new creator or has a, you know, a normal sized audience, not a Sahil sized audience, you can be using these types of events for your top of funnel and you should be going through life collecting all the interesting people that you meet and inviting them to an event like this it, what, what are your craziest story you, you posted hundreds if not thousands of parties I, I think as far as the craziest party one time I hosted with um, two other people and we each invited like 20 people and we weren't really following my formula so we expected that like half of all our people would come we'd maybe have 30 people all the other plans got canceled except for my party and so literally every single person came so many people came that our coat rack collapsed imagine 60 people no coat rack there's coats all over the floor they filled one entire bedroom like chest high of these huge puffy jackets <laughs> Um, Nick, would love to chat with you, man. I think something would, that would be great that my audience would get a lot of value out of is, you know, you wrote this book, The Two Hour Cocktail Party, which um, amazing how many five star reviews you have on Amazon, by the way, when oh, I started good. reading it, I was like, yeah, yeah, I was saw and I was like, holy crap, like Nick's the man. He's got all these great reviews. But um, I think there's some there's some overlap that we can talk about how a lot of these tech companies or how businesses, startups in general can put together some of these in-person events in order as part of their go-to-market go strategy. So thinking of how your listeners can use in-person events to juice lead gen or something like exactly, that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's mm -hmm. what I love to like. How can they put these events together? Like in terms of a strategy, right? Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear. I just, uh, I saw, I was early at a, you know, unicorn. I started a company, sold that company and then now we're building a new one. And so mm -hmm. selfishly, I'm actually trying to figure this out myself, right? It's like, how can we build an in-person strategy here? Right. Yes. I feel strongly about it. I have some thoughts, um, and I can help on that for sure. Yes. Hell dude. So let's start from square one. I'm based in Austin, right? We have a, a software company that helps with lead gen. All right. What the, where do I start, dude? Like, where the heck should I start? <laughs> So you know. when I think about events and hosting, and I've helped hundreds yeah. of people now host their first event, the yeah. biggest piece of advice I say for somebody like you who wants to use this for business is yeah. don't start focused on your top shelf, on your business, on your premium leads. Uh -huh. I suggest people that if they're thinking of hosting a launch party or a business happy hour or something, practice first on either your neighbors and your friends and your existing customers that you feel secure and comfortable with, but start in a low stakes environment. Mm -hmm. Think about mm -hmm. if you had a new sales rep, would you give them your most high value, most important clients? No, you give them like your lowest quality leads to get started. The same thing sort of is about your first party because your first party, when you run it with my formula, when you run it, you're going to be nervous. You're going to miss things and you want a safe space to practice in. Yeah. What I yeah. tell people generally is start with a mix of personal, social connections and maybe business, but don't start pure business. Then you can slowly add next time more business people, but still some of your friends, network, existing customers, and slowly you can merge it towards what you want. Um, so for example, I talked to somebody who wants to use this for real estate and they oh. want realtors, by the way, get this more than anybody else. Realtors are like client events, say less, I'll do it right now. Um, yeah. and so they understand the power of hosting events, but I tell them, I say, Hey, your first party, just host it easy. Neighbors, friends, maybe existing clients. Next time add more clients, existing clients perspective, but you still want to have the diversity of attendees so that it's not purely a sales thing. Does that make sense? I'll pause yeah. and hear your thoughts from that. Yeah. Well, you said formula, right? And I think it was the first question that people are going to have as they listen to this is what is the formula, right? And and at first, everyone go buy Nick's book, Two Hour Cocktail, because he's he's going to give away some of that stuff. Um, but like, what is the formula, right? Like what, 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 like, let's hear the magic formula because 
I've seen people rave about it. We've read the reviews on, on Amazon. Like I think on Twitter, I follow you on Twitter and uh, some people have talked great things about it. Right. So like, what is this magic formula, Nick? Like that's, that's what I think I want to get into what people will be asking here. So the formula is pretty simple and you can think about it like my name, Nick, N I C K. The N stands for name tags. You got to have name tags. This is a hill that I will die on. Even if you think that they're cheesy or that it's too formal, you really need the name tags. And the reason you need the name tags is because the purpose of this party is about all the different people that your guests will meet. Name mm -hmm. tags help bring in new people to feel welcome. Now, if you're hosting a party with the same 10 people that you have known for 20 years, you obviously don't need the name tags. But by the way, don't do that for two reasons. Number one, 10 is not enough people. What I have found is the magic number for a happy hour is about 16 to 22. That's a good number. Wow. Okay. And the next thing is don't just invite the people that you know. The purpose of these gatherings is to invite new people to mix them into your world. It's that power of loose connections or weak ties or what maybe in the sales world, what do you call these leads where they're like, they're not really in your funnel yet, but they're aware of you. What would you call it? Like prospects. We would prospects. call them like, like, like cold prospects. Yeah, we'll call them cold prospects. Yeah. That's a perfect way to think about how you can get those cold prospects into warm prospects by hosting an yeah. event like this. But I'll go through the formula first. So N stands for name tags. You're going to have name tags, first name only, big letters. I, N I. I stands for icebreakers or intros. You're going to lead two or three rounds of intros for everybody at the room to help them mix and mingle. And the word mm -hmm. icebreakers, you know, it has a bad reputation, especially among networking events. That's because people do them poorly. They do them very wrong. I've done thousands yeah. of icebreakers. <laughs> I can tell you how to do them right. What are, all right, all right. So we did name tags. That one's easy. All caps letters, just first name icebreakers. Yeah. Um, I have so many questions. You said 16 to 22 people. That's my, gonna be my, so far, my first question. My second question is gonna be, what are the top three icebreakers, right? Because as we know, some of the icebreakers are cheesy. As you know, it gets a bad rap and da da da, da. So first question, um, why 16 to 22? Is that just from hundreds of events that you've kind of found that number? Or like, what happens when it's smaller than that? What happens when it's bigger than that? Well, let's talk about what happens when it's smaller because that's probably the worst case scenario. What yeah. I have found is that for a new host, their number one fear is that not enough people will show up. And so whether it's a business event or an event at your home, I feel like everybody has had some experience where either they're really worried nobody will show up or they actually hosted and not enough people showed up. Yeah. When you have less than 16 at a happy hour, let's say you have 10, it's not enough people to keep the conversations growing and to break out into multiple small groups. When someone Got walks it. into a room and there's only 10 people, they're kind of like, oh man, this thing's kind of dead. Like they yeah. look, they're like, I can talk to everybody here. Look, I visually see everybody. 16 I found allows enough small groups to be built that allows your guests to jump to different conversations. There's new people to meet. You know you're not going to talk to everybody if there's 16 that night. So it's a little bit of FOMO, like, oh, who am I going to talk yeah. to? Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you host a party for couples, you actually want to over plan a little bit. And I'll tell you why. Couples tend to cancel in pairs. It makes sense. If one of the couples uh... can't come, then both aren't going to come. I talked to yeah. a woman who was hosting a happy hour using my book for new parents at her kid's school. She really wanted to meet the other parents, connect with the adults outside of school. And they had invited 14 people. So she said, okay, 14 plus me and my husband, that's 16. Well, it just so happened that two people could not make it. So she was already at the minimum. Two couldn't make it, but each of their spouses didn't come as well. So she that's, went from yeah. 14 people down to 10 people. And it was 12. Look, she still had an okay party. It was fine. It was better than all other parties she's done. But I tell you, this pops off when there's a lot of energy in the room and that happens yeah. for people. From, yeah, exactly. From six. Okay. So worst case is last. Then over 22, 
what's going on there? What's what's happening there? Is that like, you know, exact everyone's anxious everywhere like shit, there's so many people. Like what's going on there? Over 22 <laughs> is really for my advanced hosts. Don't do this. I know you have a lot of overachievers who listen to this pod by the nature of, <laughs> of yeah, living yeah. and working in sales. You think I can yeah. do anything. Okay, this I'll double it. Here's what happens when you have over 22, your ability as a host to make introductions, to manage personal attention to each and every person, even to do a round of intros, it's too complicated. There's too many people. So if yeah. you do a round of intros and let's say maximum people are 30 seconds each, I mean, 22, 25 people, I mean, you're getting 10, 15 minutes. That's a long time to do a round of intros. Yeah. So I want 15 to 22 for a new host. What I suggest people do is stick to that number for your first one or two parties. Get this down, just like making cold calls, just like anything. Learn the system, learn the rhythm, build that muscle memory then later you can experiment with your numbers of attendees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So start simple, do a few events and then, you know, get the the pieces down, which you're, you're giving us some of the pieces now, which next is the icebreakers. All right. So like, Nick, what are the icebreakers that like everyone loves? Because, you know, uh, let's see if I remember any icebreakers. There's like, there's like the common one, like, Tell us where you're from originally and like your favorite food or something, you know, or like, yeah, like the, the, the standard ones. But like, what, what are some icebreakers that, you know, you think people always rave about leave going, hell yeah, that was awesome. So I've thought a lot about icebreakers and I basically classify them into two different buckets. One of the buckets is easy icebreakers and the other bucket is value additive icebreakers. I'll talk about the easy icebreakers first. I want an icebreaker that's so easy to answer that people don't get stressed, anxious, or freeze up. A bad example of what some may think is an easy icebreaker, but actually isn't, is what's your favorite business book? Uh, that's actually a pretty difficult one because it causes people to try to pick a definitive, subjective, exact answer that could elicit judgment from others there. Mm. right oh mm. god what am i going to say how do i sound smart have yeah. i even read a business book like yeah. holy crap you know they're forgetting they're not knowing this stuff right mm -hmm. an easy icebreaker that i like is just hey let's go around the circle say your name say what you do for work and tell me one of your favorite things that you like to eat for breakfast what's something you like to eat for breakfast that makes you happy this is an easy thing most people had breakfast that day or didn't they choose to intermittent fast they can talk about that it's easy to answer. It's not complicated. It's a short answer. And it expresses a little bit about their personality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have the black coffee drinkers who are absolute psychos. You have <laughs> yeah, the like, dude. No, <laughs> right? Just coffee. Just coffee. Yeah. I'm, I'm like wigging out as I'm, you know, all morning. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. And then maybe you have, you know, more of the, indulgent chefs type, right? Who, oh, I really love pancakes with maple syrup and blueberries. It's a quick answer and it doesn't really matter what their answer is. We just want people to practice sounding off and talking to the group going mm -hmm. around the room. That's the mm -hmm. purpose of the icebreaker is to give a conversational crutch for people to go approach them and talk to them later. And the reason we do these intros is I hated going to parties or networking events. I never knew who was in the room. Oh, yeah. that person works in sales. I want to go talk to that person, right? Yeah. Versus yeah. otherwise, what do you do? Every conversation. Hey, what's up? How do you know the host? What do you do for work? Same question, same exact thing. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. You can make it easier for people when you lead icebreakers. Yeah. And then your value-based icebreakers. What are those ones? I want to hear that. So later on in the party, once you've established rapport, once you've built up, people are a little comfortable. They've talked with one of the easy icebreakers. I like asking a value additive icebreaker. That means everybody's answer could help the room. Three examples of those. Number one, um, I live in Austin, Texas. So I might ask, hey, for this icebreaker, we're gonna say your name, say what you do for work, say it again, even though we said it once, yeah, uh, helps to remind people. And then share, what is one of your favorite spots here in Austin that you think is a hidden gem? It could be a small business, a hiking trail, just what's uh -huh. one cool thing here in Austin? That means it's value additive that everybody will get ideas from what other people say that might help them in their life. 
I'll give you two more examples. Another example would be, hey, say your name, say what you do for work and tell me one of the best purchases you've made over the last year for $100 or less. Could be an object mm -hmm. or an experience. Mm -hmm. Could mm -hmm. be a kitchen gadget or a massage, something like that. The last and final one, and actually this is the one I use the most for value added device breaker is say your name, say what you do for work again, and then tell us one of the best pieces of media that you've consumed recently and why you liked it. And when I say piece of media, that could be a podcast like this. Mm -hmm. It could be a documentary you watched. It could be trashy reality TV on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. It could Love be a book, Island or you right, right. The ba ba Golden Bachelor, I think, is the last one I watched with my wife or something like that. Dude, yeah. I just heard a speech two nights ago from a guy who was on Love is Blind. And um, he had a, just a wild story of what his experience was like. Apparently, they were basically drunk the entire time. And the first 48 hours, did you know this? The first 48 hours, you go into social isolation mode. No TV, can't talk to the other people. So they take you to this deep low of social isolation. Then they throw them all together and start filming. And that's why the reactions, the emotions are just off the charts. Like they're just in a room with pillows alone. It's basically their hours. hotel room and they've cut the internet. And I think they even cut the TV and they're just like there, they can read, what? they can like, yeah, wild, right? That is crazy. You know, I'm having uh, Kwame, who's one of the guys on Love is Blind. He's coming on the pod in two weeks, actually. Nice. Yeah, so he's coming on the pod. So I'll have to ask him about this because this is crazy. Dude. No way. Uh, Isn't that wild? That is because they've tested that and I'm sure they know like, okay, after that, they're just going to be, they're going to be like, I don't want to say, they're going to be like animals wanting to just talk to anyone, say anything, right? Like that That's exactly <laughs> what the guy said. He was like, look, the producers do a really good job of never sort of explicitly telling you what to say or what to do, but they do yeah. plant hints or make it easier for yeah. what they want to happen. And that's a really good example of how they help make those turbocharged relationships happen by putting them in isolation beforehand. Yeah. So next version of two hour cocktail party is going to be like, all right, you cannot do anything for 48 hours. <laughs> Dude. Before you throw this party, <laughs> you Dude, have to I, sit in your garage alone. Yeah. Go ahead. Dude, listen yeah. to the party that I've been wanting to host. So I'm a caffeine addict. I drink green yeah. tea all day. I drink Coke Zero. I drink coffee. I want to host a party where probably it would be on a Monday morning and all the attendees have to promise to do no caffeine for the day beforehand. And oh, what would wow. happen is they would break their caffeine fast at the party. And I think everybody would just be totally jacked. Totally just like, really? Yes. It sounds <laughs> stupid. It's a dumb, it's a dumb idea for a silly party. But I think it'd be funny if people are just high as a kite off coffee at a party. Yeah, that would be awesome. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it would be, it would be kind of like if everyone was like drunk at a party, but the coffee high, I wonder what kind of stuff would come out of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like deals, ideas, networking. Business, yeah. Yeah, yeah, business deals, all kinds of right. crazy shit. I did. I saw on Twitter you just hosted like a, you had your birthday party, and mm -hmm. I believe I, I don't want to age you. What what your birthday party was it? it yes, was your, I was forty two, forty second your, birthday party. Your forty second birthday party. Uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was forty actually, so I would have been you know gone down here for you. But um, and you threw a you threw a like conference there for your party with like 20 or 40 of your closest friends right and yeah and so how did because you're the party master right or business party master how, how did you organize that and like what was the what was the thinking behind doing that so this was pretty difficult um of what i did i wouldn't recommend it for everybody i've i've hosted hundreds if not thousands of my own two-hour cocktail parties so i've done yeah. this i know it i can do it in my sleep but I'm experimenting with new stuff now that I'll maybe write about in three or four years. And what I experimented with for my birthday was hosting a, a conference. So instead of yeah. two hours, I actually had 20 hours of programming. It was one and a half full days 
uh, where I invited 40 of my most interesting friends from all around the world to fly in and hang out and have a lot of small group conversations with other inspiring and top creators and business owners. Yeah. Nice. And, and how did you, how'd you format that? Was that, or is that a secret, right? Is that like, oh, yeah. mastermind no, secret? no, it's just, okay. uh, um, it's not helpful to share because it's so advanced. It probably took me 160 hours of focused work to pull this off. And it's just what, what my head and many people said it was the best event that they've ever attended. And these are people who go to a lot of events. So it's something I'm very, very proud of, but it's so advanced that I just don't know if it'd be helpful for anybody. Okay, well, let, let's get back to the Nick framework then, because we kind of got out, off there. So there's C. What's C? We have N for name tags, I for icebreakers, C if you're throwing a two-hour cocktail party. What, what's that one there? Maybe I should C's, guess. Yeah, Maybe yeah, I should please. guess first. Yeah. C is for connection. Oh, I like that. Dang, that, sh- that could be connection. C is actually for cocktails or mocktails only no dinner don't serve oh, dinner okay why so many why, people why, why? have this idea that they have to serve dinner that if you're going to have people over at night you must feed them and i think that that is i'm not going to say false but i'd like to challenge people on that assumption and that my party is sort of the mvp the minimum viable party um, okay. <laughs> I like that. Because I don't like dinner parties. I think for new hosts, dinner parties are way too complicated, a bit too expensive, and they're harder to get people to say yes to that you don't know well. So I tell people, look, cocktails are mocktails only. Yes, you can have snacks. You can have some finger foods, but this is not a seated dinner. Don't do a dinner party. Okay. Don't do a dinner party. And so if I'm just doing a mocktail or cocktail party then i'm probably going to do something at like 5 or 6 p.m before you know people get like hangry is what i'm yeah. guessing right because yeah. once people get hangry i feel i mean i get hangry if i don't eat by like Same. seven i'm like yeah <laughs> i'm like i need some food man so yes so cocktails or mocktails and then you mentioned once you throw dinner in the mix expensive um, makes it more complicated um, too because you have to get everyone sitting around. What do you do while you're all eating? Right? Well, and that's the thing is that sitting down is the kryptonite to a successful gathering. And here's why. Because when you're hosting a happy hour, you know, it's a business pod, so I can say networking event. I don't like to say networking event too much because it does have a negative reputation. But yeah. think for your listeners to imagine a networking event The last thing you want to do is have seated groups. It's impossible for new people to join seated groups. People get locked in. They get stuck in conversations. This party, why it will be successful for you to nurture your cold leads is because you're going to get everybody talking to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And then for you, if you want to make those leads warm, I can tell you how to make those leads warmer. The secret is that You have to schedule the call or the coffee meeting at the end of your party. Don't try to follow up to them the next day or the next week. The half-life of obligation or reciprocity for a party invite is very short. So Mm -hmm. if I'm wanting to connect with somebody, I'll invite them to one of my events, show them that I host a good event, do a good job. And then towards the end of the party, say, hey, John, man, we didn't get to connect. I'd love to follow up. Can we schedule something to have a quick phone call tomorrow or schedule lunch sometime next week. Let's open our phones. Can we book it now? And when they're in your world, Mm -hmm. when you have added value with a good event, they are definitely ready and open and receptive. Mm. Yeah. That's like very similar to like a sales tactic that a lot of people use, which is like, don't get off the call without the next meeting, like on the, you know, on the thing, which is good in person though. In person takes some guts to do that. Right. Cause it feels a little, it might feel a little, like, oh, okay, this this guy's ready to go. He's like, get out your phone, like, let's do it, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, but if you yeah. run a good event and you show that you're interesting, here's the thing, people want to know those who bring people together. Everybody wants to know someone who hosts a good party. That if yeah. you're going to do this, not as soon as they arrive, right? You're not going to say, oh my God, thank you so much for coming. Can we schedule? No, you're going to give them a good experience for an hour and a half. You're going to introduce them to other people, really host them, 
And then once you've added value, then you can ask. We have to give before you can take. You know this. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. What's the K? Actually, before I, let me guess what the K is. K is for, um, ooh, man, K is for uh, knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge, yeah, know about this. No, K stands for kick them out at the end. The party is only. <laughs> I love this. Okay. Okay. Isn't, isn't that good? Yeah, that is good. Kick them out. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Okay. What's the K what's stands the for kick them out at the end. The party is only two hours long. And a lot of people have trouble with this. Folks, you know, in Mexico, Spain, oh, this could never work where I am. Trust me, I've worked with people in Italy, Spain. South America, Asia, you can host a party. And in fact, people will thank you for kicking them out at the end. And they will appreciate and respect you more when you end the party on top. And a lot of people wait for the party to slowly drizzle out or this, that, or the other. Trust me, this is an efficient, well-run event. And you want to have both a start time and an end time. There's many reasons for that. But yes, you want to kick them out at the end. What what's the thinking behind that? It kind of it creates some FOMO, maybe of like, oh, I can't wait for the next one. That's kind of my first thought. Or what's kind of the thinking behind that, Nick? Few pieces of thinking. Number one is when you compress your party to only two hours, more people show up on time. So just imagine the uh, difference in a three-hour event. If you show up an hour late, you're okay. You still got two hours. For a two-hour party, if you show up an hour late, you're only there for an hour. So people don't pull that move anymore. You also are easier to get yeses. Think about it. If you have a cold prospect, a cold lead, there it's a pretty easy ask to drop by sometime for a two hour happy hour. Yeah. That's like an easy thing. You know, they can get dinner afterwards, they can leave, it's a happy hour, or whatever. The other reason you want to end it after two hours is you actually want to end it on a high note. People remember the last moments of any event that they go to. And when you end it when things are going well. Not like, oh, slowly drag it out, let the vibe die, let people sneak out, blah, blah, blah. When you end it, when things are on top, they'll respect you and they'll want to come back to your next one. Because mm -hmm. remember, I could write any book that could just give you ideas on how to host one party. But the people who get the biggest benefits from this are those that learn how to make hosting a habit. It is part mm -hmm. of who they are and what they do. They constantly are dropping people into this top of funnel that's their happy hour, whatever. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you see a lot of creators kind of listen to this, this pod too? And how do you see, you know, we've talked about doing this for like networking events, which I know get a bad rap, but like, how do you see some creators doing this today? Are, are they kind of leveraging this in, in their strategies? I, I see, have seen some people like Sahil do some stuff like this. I've seen, um, who uh, like, uh, Lenny, like he did, he does like a product management podcast. He's done some like events, like, yeah. Um, so we'd love to hear how you see these creators leveraging their, their events for this strategy and kind of what, what their outcomes are for that. Um, for the average listener, who's a new creator or has a, you know, a normal sized audience, not a Sahil sized audience, but a normal sized audience. You can be using these types of events for your top of funnel and you should be going through life collecting all the interesting people that you meet and inviting them to an event like this. So think about life yeah. as a creator. You have a lot of people reaching out to you, a lot of people mm -hmm. that you meet, a lot of people want to connect. It's impossible for you to have meetings with all those people. Instead, invite them to one of your meetups, invite them to one of your happy hours as a way for you to vet them and get to know them a little bit better. So that's yeah. my biggest advice and that that I see the most successful people is they constantly have a way. Oh, dude, what's up? I host a happy hour every other month. Can I get your info? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's link up. You're coming to my next event. That's mm -hmm. that's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to do like for me, my my personality is very like uh, I like I'm an adrenaline kind of seeker. Right. Where like I like to surf. I like to like and kite surf. I like to do a lot of this stuff. So I would love to do something that's like in that realm you know i think i think there um danny miranda i'm sure you know who, who danny is but we he yeah. was on the pod a few weeks ago um he, he's doing a run club which i thought was pretty interesting right he does like a run club every yes. tuesday morning i believe it is i i've been mm -hmm. in mexico so i haven't joined but um sorry danny if you're listening to this uh but uh 
Yeah, I think like a run club is something I've seen people put together. Have you seen any other kind of unique ways people have put together, not necessarily a cocktail party, but just these like these gatherings that basically build community and help you, yeah, essentially build community there. Um, I like what Elle is doing with her morning walks on here in Austin. She does them on Saturday morning. Um, I'll try to think of some other ones. There's a guy named Henry who has a uh, e-com meetup in New York City. But the idea of gathering community is so powerful and it will change you from someone that's having to work for your outbound to instead getting inbound of meeting yeah. new people. And after about two events, you'll be known as someone who hosts good events. It's one of the most shocking, surprising things that people report back to me, that they are blown away that now they're getting inbound people that they should meet, which never happened to them before. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy, right? And, it, and obviously that, that's something that you want. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, so Nick, have you ever done any like bigger conference events? Like let's say your company is doing, you know, like let's call it a conference with like sponsors and stuff like that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you translate this from, you know, something, you know, with 16 to 22 people to then a bigger conference that you want to throw that like is you have sponsors, you know, probably a hundred two to 200 people shoot, maybe more mm. like, you know, how, how have you thought about translating this to that? And is that just a whole different beast maybe that, that you don't kind of think about or worry about at this point? Um, I think the best person to follow for that is a guy named um, Andrew Young. Um, okay. Uh, his last name is spelled Y-E-U-N-G. And he's yeah. based out of New York City. Um, he's the best guy to follow for those larger events, getting sponsors. And yeah. I think he's been really successful in hosting tech networking events with sponsors. That's a harder game and um, it's more advanced. And so I don't feel as skilled to talk about that. <laughs> no, no worries. Man. No worries. I was just wondering because, you know, it feels like you got the layout, you've got the framework, you've got the formulas to make people like, oh, holy crap, like this is great. I want to go to more of Nick's or Andy's parties. Right. And so I'm also thinking, you know, for a lot of a lot of companies, that maybe you want to do a user, a customer event or like a user event, right? Which maybe they might have thousands of users and inviting those people. What the best kind of approach for that one would be? But that's a whole different ballpark, right? These are more like these are going to be more events for closer networking, for closer relationships, for eventually your highest value prospects, maybe like a wine party or cocktail party, whatever it may be. Um, so that's awesome, man. Now with this, you did the two hour cocktail party. What, what are you going to write about next? I think maybe leaning more into the networking event stuff. Um, I think there's maybe. a gold mine, man. Yeah. That's a gold mine. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Figuring out, you know, um, giving a, t a playbook or a toolkit to people who want to host meetups or client events. I think that would be pretty powerful. Um, but I'm not sure for now, my number one goal is to get 500 people to read my book and host an event and become what I call a verified party host. And that means that they, they use name tags and they send me a group photo and they follow my formula. So I'm like laser focused on getting those first 500 people to see what I can learn from that. But if I had to pick right now, I would say that I'd lean into that. Lean into that. Nice, man. And then something that comes to mind is the party happens. What do you do after? Right. Like after the party happened, because do you fall, are you following up with people individually, like, like as the host, right? Like what, what's oh, kind yeah. of the game plan there and the strategy that you've used in order to get people to the next one? Great question. So I do send a thank you message the morning after with the yeah. group photo and at the party, by the way, I didn't mention this, but you really have to make sure you take a group photo. I'll tell you why, because you're going to use that group photo as social proof when you reach out to invite other people to your next parties. Mm -hmm. If you're listening mm -hmm. to this, wanting to use it for sales for biz dev, you are going to be doing outreach, maybe on LinkedIn, maybe on something else. You're going to use that group photo to show them, Hey, look, I host these fun events. Look at all these people um, would love to invite you sometime and introduce you to some of the other interesting people I know. So I send the group photo the morning after I thank people 
And then if you're feeling good, if you're feeling motivated, inspired and encouraged, then you'd set the date for your next party. And you would choose a date, maybe four to six to eight weeks in advance to plan your next party and start to think who else you want to invite and which repeat guests. So at the end of my parties, I do tend to make a little list of the great guests, people who were really good, who showed up, who volunteered, who helped out, who were outgoing, maybe not even outgoing. Maybe they were like introverts who just had great things to say and seemed to really appreciate the party. I -hmm. like to make a list of those people. And then for sure, you want to invite them back. It, what, what are your craziest story? You've, you've hosted hundreds, if not thousands of parties. I, I think um, the only parties I hosted were like years ago in college, right? <laughs> so, oh, what are some of your look, crazy stories? Oh, man. Uh, I, I don't know if they're PG enough for this uh, for this. OK, OK. <laughs> Fair. Uh, they 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 might be a little too uh, R rated for this podcast, but. Um, I'm trying to think of a recent one where I've had some like either wild stories or horror stories, uh, in terms of a party. I'm trying to think here. Um, nothing that comes to mind right now, but again, I haven't hosted that many parties, so it's hard for me, but how about you? Have you had any like just wild stories from a party you've hosted or like horror stories or anything like that? You know, I went to a party recently that was for launching an app and, They kind of did everything wrong that you could do. And so maybe I'll share some of those stories for anybody that might be helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. So at the party, I did a survey of people that I didn't know what the app did. I just, I got the invite um, and it seemed interesting. So I stopped by. I asked around to the party, hey, do you know what this app does? What does this app do? Nobody knew. Nobody had any idea what, why we were there, what was going on. Second, the host never made any announcements or introductions. It was more of a cool party with a DJ, dark lights, you know, some photographers, but it was a cool vibe, which actually wasn't good for what they were trying to do, which is launch an app. Yeah. Uh, And it was just too loud. It was too loud. It was too dark. Um, the, The host really didn't take any leadership to add any amount of structure. And so I felt like last night they probably spent thousands of dollars on that party to launch the app. And I don't think it was successful at all. Uh, and yet it's what they thought a good party was supposed to be, right? Like yeah, a good yeah, DJ. Like music they foc- and, right. Yeah. They focused yeah. on all the wrong things. See, I would rather leave somebody. It's why I say no food. I would rather someone leave my party hungry rather than bored. Okay. Mm. Because in my mind, it's more important to keep them entertained, meeting interesting people. They can eat on their own. My friends are adults. But yeah. Helping them meet, mix, mingle, that's that's up to the host. So that's the host duty. As far as the craziest party, one time I hosted with um, two other people and we each invited like 20 people and we weren't really following my formula. So we expected that like half of all our people would come. We'd maybe have 30 people. It just so happened that that night was like a weird night in New York where it was either a snowstorm or something where... All the other plans got canceled except for my party. And so literally every single person came. So many people came that our coat rack rack collapsed. Imagine 60 people, no coat rack. There's coats all over the floor. They filled one entire bedroom like chest high of these huge puffy jackets. The room was packed wall to wall. I'm talking like crowded subway station. And I was freaking out at first, and then I just resigned to the chaos and ended up being a good night. It was a lot of fun. It was definitely memorable, but perhaps not ideal for a new host. Yeah. How do you stay like chill as a host, right? Because like a couple of things that I've hosted, Mm. and this is me probably just being a perfectionist, right? It's me being like, okay, we got to make sure this is, this is right, or this is right, or this is right. Like, how do you kind of stay still chill where you're you're able to get value out of it yourself and able to still network and make sure everything's going well and i'm sure it's a mindset thing right but like Mm. what keeps you calm in those events when you do that um because i have that issue personally and i'm sure other people do it's Mm. probably just it comes with experience maybe i don't know um but that's something that i'm always worried about right is like is everything happening at the right time should we do this next i'm always like worrying about the next thing the next thing the next thing I wish I could tell you that 
you can both host a great party and enjoy it as a guest, but that's really not the case. When you are hosting a good mm -hmm. party, you always need to have one eye on the door, on the room, watching things, just to make people feel served and to make the room mix up and new conversations. So it's very hard for me hosting my own party to even drop into a deep five minute conversation. Even five minutes is, a, is hard for me to drop into because I'm running events, I'm welcoming people, I'm cleaning, I'm tidying, I'm making introductions. Your results and your successes will come from hosting from the connections that you'll make. I can't mm. tell you the number of people who probably would accept my random phone call right now. And nobody accepts random phone calls, by the way, right? Like mm -hmm, nobody, like mm -hmm, if you call no. somebody these days, like you're a like stone cold killer. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I barely, I call two people today, my mom and my wife. And like, that's right, it. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And even then I'm kind of like, oh, I, uh, you know. But yeah. I do find that folks will accept my calls and that's because I've built up such a good reputation as a host that will happen. Mm. And it's kind of you're building up your social credit score by hosting these events. You will become more important, more desired. You'll get invited to more events. People will introduce you to others naturally. And for somebody that works in sales, I just can't say how wild that is of going from needing to do outbound to literally once you host, look, this isn't going to happen after your first party. But once you get to be known as a good host, which by the way, the bar is so low to host a good event right now. Once you become known as a good host, you'll be introduced to people all the time. It's really a nice mm -hmm. perk. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of why I do this podcast, right? Like, yeah, this is this is part of it is like one to one connection. You know, and like, it, again, this isn't a, a big cocktail party. It's a lot easier from a from a, a getting on a call right now and doing the editing and all managing the process. Yeah, that can be a pain in the butt of like getting it out there. Right. But overall, like that's pretty much why I do this is because I can I'm, I'm also built one. I want to learn from people and typically I have an objective of like, OK, I want to learn about how to throw in-person events. Who's the person? Oh, Nick is the person for that. I want to learn from him. And also in the meantime, I'm building like a new friend, right? It's kind of like yeah. the way I think about it. And so in the future, I could probably be like, hey, Nick, I need, I need to call you. Can I get your five minutes of your feedback on this thing I'm thinking? Right. And like, guess what? Like, Nick, you, most likely you'll probably be like, yeah, sure, man, give me a call or whatever. Right. Um, and so that is kind of, that honestly mm. is one of my main pieces of doing this pod as well. Um, Heck and yeah. from it too comes, some inbound and some people be like, Hey, I heard your pot on this. Like, what can you connect me with Nick or can you, you know, whatever that may be like yes. that stuff comes from it too. And which I also really enjoy, you know? Um, so have you ever, this brings me to a question. Have you ever thought about doing like a virtual version of what you do? And I know that's I don't like way virtual. Do, you don't like, yeah. okay. you don't no, like I don't like virtual. And I've had a lot of people who've asked about that. I find it's just so hard to get those natural jump in between conversations, the energy. And so I'm just yeah. laser focused on live events and I think it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. You keep the focus. That's good. That's something I need to work on. Oh yeah. 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 Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Um, yeah, we had till 945. Sorry. We we're over, over that or 1045, but, um, Nick, dude, it was great chatting with you, my friend. Um, thank you, Andy. That's awesome. Yeah.